Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I am your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. This episode does contain foul language. It's not suitable for younger listeners. This is episode nine of season three of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was about five foot two inches tall, and weighed approximately 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful and the facts scarce. We are starting from the beginning. And by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance as we bring to you the findings of our investigation in real time. In a past episode, we told you that Jessica's family has never understood why Jessica chose to reach out to Alicia Motes as soon as she checked out of the Journey Detox facility. Jessica's mom, Lynn, expressed her confusion over this. You know, her going to Alicia's from detox, you know, that's just, uh, it was shocking to me because back when Jessica did work at Walmart, she got a Alicia a job up there, and eventually I think Alicia was fired for stealing, and they had a falling out about that because, you know, it looked bad on Jessica's reputation. Long story short, I didn't even know they were in touch with each other again, honestly, after that. So, yeah, I was absolutely just floored. Like, you know, why? Of her, of all people, and why didn't she call me? Jessica's dad, Keith, expressed similar sentiments. It's always puzzled me. You know, she could use the phone. She could use the landline phone. She wasn't allowed to use her cell phone. And I thought maybe she got a hold of Alicia or something. I don't know that for sure. But, I mean, it's just odd to me that Jessica would just pick Alicia to get in contact with, to go hang out with. That's always been bothersome to me. I mean, Jessica had friends in a lot of places. She could have went to other places, other friends. Why Alicia and Derek? I never got that. Apparently, Jessica's family members aren't the only ones confused by Jessica's decision to contact Alicia. On September 14th, 2022, Eric Edwards was arrested on a bench warrant, and he was placed in the Marion County Jail. This arrest has absolutely nothing to do with Jessica. We shared his mugshot and a screenshot of the arrest that was displayed on the Marion County Sheriff's Office website on our Facebook page. This seemed to agitate some of Eric's family members, and a few of them commented on the post. One of those family members was Stephanie Cochran, who is Eric's cousin, but has lived in Raymond and Louise's home at times over the years. She and her sister, Tiffany Cochran, have stated that Eric is more like their brother due to how they were raised together. While we are talking about connections, it's interesting to note that Stephanie was married in 2016 to Cody Jackson. Cody is the son of Randy Jackson, 
the former county coroner involved in Jeremy Abbott's death case, whose records we reviewed in a previous episode. Cody's brother Kyle was just elected to his father's previous position as Marion County Coroner in 2022 and will soon take office. Stephanie made numerous comments on the Facebook post, but one comment really stood out. She wrote, Has it ever occurred to y'all that why did Jessica contact Alicia out of everybody? Hmm, maybe because they were Kenny's little helpers, and she knew, she may knew, what to do, hell I don't know. I know it's all strange, because I have personally tried to get into that detox and didn't have the money, and he told me, well then, I guess you do it yourself. So I'm just saying, that's not how you help people. In other words, he don't try to help any damn body. Jessica had been to rehab several times. We knew this as her family shared this with us early on. What we did not know that we've learned since the last episode, in part thanks to Stephanie, is that Jessica had been in rehab in 2017. We learned Jessica entered a rehab program in Hackleburg known as Resurrection Ranch. Resurrection Ranch, it's misspelled in the official business filing as Rescorrection Ministry, was operated by Ray and Laura Hart. It appears the rehab opened sometime in 2016, but it wasn't open too long. While no public announcement was made that we can find, it appears that the rehab stopped taking in women by the end of 2017. Although it appears the rehab was no longer an active rehab facility, Ray Hart did announce in June 2018 that they had officially received their nonprofit status, apparently referring to them filing the operation as a domestic nonprofit with the state of Alabama. We were unable to locate a record of the business receiving 5013C status from the IRS, though. I guess that the nonprofit was and maybe still is used to minister in ways other than an active rehab facility, but we do not have any information on their current activities. We've also learned that while he had no official position with the ministry, Sergeant Jason Williams with the Haleyville Police Department was supportive of Resurrection Ranch Rehab, and we are told he brought several women there that wanted to get clean. Williams is the law enforcement officer that Jessica chose to confide in to provide the location of Jeremy Abbott's body. He was also one of the officers that went to Benefield Farm Road and found Jeremy hanging in that pine tree. The Kenny that Stephanie Cochran was referencing in her comment is Kenny Hallmark, the current chief of police in Hackleburg. He is listed as a director for Resurrection Ranch. Chief Hallmark was also the chief of police in Hackleburg in 2017, although he either retired or resigned that position in the fall of 2018. According to Hallmark's LinkedIn profile, after he left his position at Hackleburg in 2018, he worked as a part-time patrol deputy for a department you will all be familiar with, the Walker County Sheriff's Office. And at the same time, he was also a school resource officer for the city of Russellville. Beginning in December 2020, for approximately two years, Hallmark was the chief of Bear Creek Police Department. He resigned that position in March 2022 to take back his former position as the chief of police in Hackleburg, where he is as of today. You've heard us mention Chief Hallmark before because he was one of the law enforcement officers who participated in Jessica's missing persons case. You'll hear more about this later in this episode. Jessica entered the Hackleburg Rehab called Resurrection Ranch at the end of April 2017. 
We don't know how long she was there during her first stay, but we know she left the program early. It's been estimated to us that she stayed three to four weeks, so we know she was not at the rehab facility by the 1st of June, 2017. Jeremy Abbott's mom, Kim, told us that the last time she saw Jeremy was on June 16th, 2017. We knew that Kim realized very quickly that Jeremy was missing. I mean, what made you start looking for for Jeremy? Is it just because he hadn't been by your house? He would go, you know, a day or two without talking to anybody. But it was more because of the situation that had happened the last day that I seen him because um, him and his baby's mama, Rebecca, had gotten into it at my house. So, you know, then he said, well, I'm going back to Haleville. He said, I love you and I'll see you later. That was the last time I heard from him. I told him to make sure once he got back to Haleville and he got Internet to make sure that he contacted me, but he never did. Kim has since told me that to the best of her recollection, Jeremy probably left her home around 2 to 3 p.m. that afternoon, and she never heard from him again. This is significant because we learned another important piece of information since the last episode. Sometime on the night of June 16th, 2017, Jessica Hamby checked herself back into Resurrection Ranch. This leads us to believe that whatever happened to Jeremy began on June 16th after he left his mom's home and that when Jessica ran, she ran right back to Resurrection Ranch Rehab. We don't know how long Jessica stayed the second trip, but we believe it was likely for only a few days and probably for no more than a week. There was one more revelation in this new information. While we knew that Jessica and Alicia had been in the same rehab at some point in time, we didn't know when. We have been able to confirm that Jessica and Alicia Motes were at Resurrection Ranch in Hackleburg at the same time during both of Jessica's stays at the rehab. The information we've received indicates that Alicia remained at the rehab facility for quite some time after Jessica left. We have to wonder if Jessica confided in anyone at Resurrection Ranch Rehab about what she saw happen to Jeremy Abbott. She and Alicia were childhood friends. Could their reconnection at the rehab facility have recreated a strong enough bond of trust and friendship that Jessica would have confided in Alicia what she saw that night that she wasn't supposed to see? And could that be what led Jessica to contact Alicia as soon as she checked out of Journey Detox on the night of January 2nd, 2018? As you heard in the last episode, we believe that Jessica was with Mary at the Imperial Inn, often referred to as the Haleyville Motel, but we do believe Jessica likely left before Christmas. The information we have received that Jesse Abbott showed up at the motel and threatened Jessica with a gun is credible information. We aren't certain where Jessica spent Christmas Day, but we do know the location we've been told she was picked up in the early morning hours of December 26th. We've also learned that Jessica made the call for someone to come get her that morning because she'd seen the person she was staying with speaking to two men, a man called Big Mike and one of the Abbots. We do not know which Abbot, nor are we certain of the identity of Big Mike. Initially, we were provided inaccurate information about where Jessica was on December 26th until she left for detox on December 28th. We were told she was at a woman named Jerrica Jaton's house, but that information is not correct. Jessica was at the home of a married couple in Phil Campbell, 
some of those present in that home have told us that Alicia Motes and her brother, Eric Motes, were there too. Eric, Derek, and Alicia are siblings. You'll hear more about him later in this episode. While we do not know for certain what had Jessica in such a hurry to leave that home on the night of the 28th, we believe a pattern has been established. Jessica was scared, and she was being threatened. She was on the run, trying to hide, and she was hopping from one place to the next. It is our belief that she was likely threatened again that day, and that's when Jessica made the decision to go to Journey Detox that night. Maybe it was her interactions with Alicia during this time that led Jessica to run straight to Alicia when she left the detox facility just days later. But what is the connection between the group of people Jessica was with in the Hamilton area and the death of Jeremy Abbott? We believe there are several connections, and Mary was helpful in explaining it too. I know that there's not many of the ones that like the Alicia Motes and the Derek Motes and the Eric Edwards and Tank and all those. I know all of them. We all ran in the same circle. And that's not necessarily a good thing, but, you know, thank God I was able to get out of it. But we all ran around in pretty much the same circle together. We all got high together. Do you have any idea what her relationship was like with Alicia? As far as I know, they were just friends and like, well, not even friends, like more or less associates. The information Mary provided months ago relates to some newer information we've learned. We've been told that in the month of December 2017 especially, Jessica and Mary were both frequent visitors to a man's apartment in Haleyville. While this man is not an Abbott, we are told that he was related to Jeremy Abbott, and at times, Jeremy lived with him. Eric Edwards was described to us as a good friend of this man, and we were told that Eric was also a frequent guest at this man's home. Another more intimate connection lies with Alicia. Jeremy's mom, Kim, first mentioned a man named Daniel Luna to you in episode 5. Previously, we told you that someone went through Alicia Moat's phone. One of the things they found in it was a photo of a dead man on the streets of Tijuana, Mexico, and they took a photo of the photo displayed on Alicia's phone. We were able to confirm this man was Daniel Luna who's long been rumored to have played a significant role in Jeremy's murder. Alicia and Luna had a relationship, and her Facebook messages revealed the two were still in communication with each other after Jessica's disappearance. There were messenger phone calls between the two. Luna sent her numerous audio and text messages via messenger. One of the messages he sent to Alicia said, It's like that, huh? Just hang up on me. I love you and miss you. I swear I do. You know, I really had something real in my heart for you. Remember that while you're bullshitting. He also told her to stay clean, stay free, and he would be back. Maybe he was planning to leave on his own, before he was deported, as it was rumored that he was. Or maybe that rumor is not true, and Luna left by choice, and the deportation rumor is just that, a rumor. If you recall, the night Jessica checked out of detox, just seven minutes before Jessica sent her first message to anyone, Travis Jackson, who went by the name John Deere on Facebook, sent Jessica a message asking her to call him. Jessica's first message that night was sent to Travis at 9.02 p.m. She said, Hey, boo. And then she tried to call him as he'd requested, 
but her call went unanswered. At 9.04 p.m., Jessica sent Alicia Motes a friend's request on Facebook. A minute later, Alicia accepted her request. At 9.07 p.m., Jessica called Alicia through Messenger, and they spoke for 73 seconds. We won't go through all of these messages again, as they've been covered in earlier episodes, but it can be summarized as this. After she checked out of the detox facility, the only people that Jessica communicated with that night consisted of her one message, an unanswered call to Travis Jackson, a message to a woman asking if Marcos was around, her text messages with Brooke, the woman she left the detox facility with that gave her a ride, and Alicia Motes. In the very first episode, we told you this. From the beginning of Jessica's disappearance, it has generally been believed that Jessica didn't leave the rehab with the intention of going to see Alicia. Law enforcement was able to obtain Jessica's location data beginning at the time they left the rehab. The route they drove was not the most direct route to get to Alicia's location. And when viewing the location data alongside the messages between Jessica and Alicia, it would support that they changed course near the time that Jessica asked her if she could stay with her that night. However, as we poured over this data, we noticed an important detail. The very first message Alicia sent to Jessica through Eric's Facebook Messenger account was a map to her location. Alicia sent her location to Jessica prior to their later conversation about Jessica going to where Alicia was. Unfortunately, the decision to turn to Alicia and Derek Motes, Eric Edwards, Shane Reynolds, and the others Jessica ended up with that night was a terrible miscalculation, and ultimately, it ended with Jessica's disappearance by the next morning, and nothing but lies from all those who were known to have last been with her. Jessica's mom, Lynn, found out the next day that Jessica left the detox facility. At first, she assumed Jessica wasn't contacting her because Jessica thought she'd be mad at her for leaving. As it approached a week without hearing from Jessica, Lynn began to worry. She was calling, texting, and messaging her, but Jessica wasn't responding. Lynn contacted Keith, who was out of the country on a business trip for his job. I got a couple of messages from Lynn. I can't find Jessica. I can't get a hold of Jessica. And it had been four or five days, a week, whatever. And I said, well, you know, in that situation, you're like, because of what she was involved in, I mean, four or five days ain't nothing for a parent not to hear from their kid. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, come think of it. Hey, heard from her. So I told Lynn, I said, go to Haleville Police Department and file a missing person's report. And when I get back, I'll contact them. I'll go down there. Lynn and Keith both believe that she filed the missing persons report on January 14th, 2018, which we now know to be 11 days after Jessica disappeared. On January 15th, the Marion County Sheriff's Office made a Facebook post stating that Jessica Hamby was missing and asking that anyone who'd seen her after January 2nd at Lakeland Hospital contact them. That post was shared over 1,700 times, including by friends of Alicia and Derek Motes, Eric Edwards, and Shane Reynolds, and also by most of the sheriff's offices in the surrounding counties. Alicia, Eric, and Shane were all active on Facebook during this time frame. 
While it's not as apparent that Derek Motes was also active on Facebook, because for some unknown reason, he deleted virtually every bit of data from his Facebook account, we can state for certain that he was actively using Facebook and Messenger as well. While Derek wiped his own account clean, many of his messages can still be read from the information received from search warrants served on the accounts of others that he was communicating with. None of these people contacted law enforcement to let them know they'd seen Jessica, that they'd been with Jessica. It's rather suspicious since they all claim she simply left walking while they were asleep. If that's the case, why wouldn't any of them contact Jessica's family or law enforcement to provide such vital information? We aren't certain what date it was that law enforcement discovered Jessica had been given a ride to Gilbert Shaw's camper, but we do know that they had this information by January 24th at the latest. A few from the group did send Jessica messages via Facebook Messenger after her disappearance. Again, Derek Motes wiped his account clean, but the messages he sent to Jessica are still in her account. On January 4th, Derek sent Jessica a message that said, What happened to you? On January 7th, he sent her a link to a Facebook post he'd made. The post was wiped too, so we don't have any idea what was on it. On January 11th, he sent her another message that said, Are you okay, Jessica? On January 19th, he shared another one of his now-deleted Facebook posts with her. Eric Edwards' account shows that he called Jessica via messenger on January 18th. The call went unanswered. Seconds after he made that call to her, he sent her an audio message. We do not know the contents of that audio. A minute later, he placed another unanswered phone call to Jessica, and seconds after that, he sent her another audio message. On January 19th, another message was sent from Eric Edwards' Facebook account to Jessica. It said, Jessica, this is Alicia. Please contact someone, anyone, and let us know that you were okay, please. Those are the only messages to Jessica from that Facebook account. Alicia Motes continued to message Jessica after her disappearance, but she strangely deleted all communications between them from her Facebook account. However, the messages were retrieved from Jessica's account. On January 3rd, Alicia sent Jessica a message that said, Where you at? On January 4th, Alicia sent Jessica a message that just said, hey. One minute later, she called Jessica via messenger. Of course, that call was not answered. Seconds after placing that call to Jessica, Alicia sent her another message that said, are you okay, girl? Alicia didn't message Jessica again until three days later on January 7th. The message said, Hello? On January 13th, at 9.24 p.m., Alicia sent the first of a series of messages. The messages said, Hey, are you okay? People are worried about you. If you need me, hit me up. And she gave Jessica her phone number. Alicia's own words reveal that she knew people were worried about Jessica, yet she nor any of the others ever contacted Jessica's family or the police. Those were the last messages Alicia sent to Jessica from her own account. Jessica had more than one Facebook account, but she was only actively using one of them. However, 
when law enforcement obtained the search warrants for Jessica's Facebook accounts, they included one of her other accounts, too. Because she wasn't actively using it, there wasn't a lot of data in it. We did find something significant, though. Eric Edwards sent one message to Jessica on her inactive Facebook account on January 18th at 3.36 p.m. The message said, Hey, are you okay? Please contact someone, Jessica, and let us know you're okay. At first, I thought maybe we'd overlooked this message in Eric Edwards' Facebook account. But then we discovered this message was sent to Jessica through a different Facebook account for Eric Edwards. This account had no profile picture, no photos at all. He only had 13 friends, and any post he'd ever made or shared has either been deleted or the account is set to private so that only his friends can see his post. As we dug deeper into the data from all the Facebook accounts, we noticed something else. On January 18th, at 3.42 p.m., six minutes after the second account of Eric's sent Jessica that message, another message was sent from the same account to Alicia and Derek's brother, Eric Motes. Remember, Eric Motes and Alicia were reported to be at the same home Jessica was at in Phil Campbell from December 26th until she left for the detox facility on the night of December 28th. The message read, Hey, this is your sister. You need to call me ASAP. She gave him Eric Edwards' cell phone number. Seconds later, She sent another message to Eric Motes that said, Also, I need Lacey and Josh's number, but call me as quick as you can. Love you. Lacey and Josh are the names of the couple whose home Jessica was at on the 26th through the 28th. And this is the same home where Eric Motes and Alicia are said to have been sometime during that same time frame while Jessica was present. It seems unusual that Eric Edwards would need a second Facebook account. It's not unusual to see people have multiple and sometimes even numerous accounts, but it's not typical for someone to be active on multiple accounts at the same time. Ironically, Eric Edwards' primary account and Eric Moat's account had been connected on Facebook Messenger since January 3rd, 2018, the day Jessica disappeared. While Alicia Motes deleted all of her messages with her brother Eric from her Facebook account, they were still present in Eric's account. The two siblings communicated extensively and on a regular basis. You have to wonder why Alicia would need to message him from what appears to be an Eric Edwards secret squirrel account instead of from her own account, or Eric Edwards' primary account, or even by simply calling him on the phone. When you add to it that she stated it was urgent and that she needed to speak to the people whose house she, Eric Motes, and Jessica were at right before Jessica fled to the detox, it's downright suspicious. There was one other message that we can see that was sent from the Eric Edwards secret squirrel account. On January 18th at 3.53 p.m., this second Eric Edwards account created a group message with Eric Motes, and Jessica Hamby's inactive account. Eric Edwards' account shared a link to a post he'd made from the Secret Squirrel account to the group message. Either that post has been deleted or the account is set to private because it isn't visible to us. As previously stated, 
We aren't sure what exact day it was that law enforcement tracked Jessica to Alicia, Derek, Eric Edwards, and Shane Reynolds, but we are pretty certain that they knew where Jessica went by January 24th. Going back to Kenny Hallmark, Stephanie Cochran's mention of Kenny's Little Helpers is interesting, too, because it's clear from now-deleted Facebook post that Alicia did know then-Hackleburg Police Chief Kenny Hallmark. Alicia and Hallmark were friends on Facebook, and it appears that he was able to make contact with her outside of Facebook, too. On January 24th, Alicia messaged Kenny, and from the context of the conversation, it appears that the two had communicated in a different manner prior to these messages. Alicia had apparently asked Chief Hallmark to check the warrant portal to see if she had an outstanding warrant in Franklin County. As that conversation wrapped up, she asked Hallmark what time he wanted her to come up there. He asked her when she could. She told him she'd be there in a little while, and then she sent him another message that said, Am I going to jail? You can be honest with me. You know I ain't no runner, but I would like to have a heads up because I've got court Monday on my daughter. He responded, telling her that she wasn't going to jail. Almost an hour later, Alicia called Kenny via Facebook Messenger, and their conversation lasted for 65 seconds. Five hours after that, Chief Hallmark sent Alicia another message asking where she was. She responded to him 20 minutes later. The message said, Well, my ride wouldn't bring me because I was coming to see police but I have someone who is going to bring me to church tonight. I promised Ray I would be there. We are assuming that she is referring to Ray Hart from Resurrection Ranch Rehab. There are no further messages showing between Alicia and Chief Hallmark until February 12th. He messaged her to ask that she call him and then there's a series of messages where they appeared to play phone tag. Following those messages, Alicia sent Hallmark screenshots of all the messages between Eric Edwards and Jessica from the night Jessica left the detox facility. She followed up by asking Hallmark to call her because she needed to tell him something. On February 16th, 2018, Alicia went live with a video on Facebook, apparently from the back of Kenny Hallmark's patrol car. She added the comment, going to jail, when she posted it. And less than a minute later, she made another comment that said, I love you, Kenny. Less than 30 seconds later, Kenny Hallmark commented, ha ha, you too. This video is almost legendary in the Marion, Winston, and Franklin County area. If we had a nickel for every time it's been mentioned to us, we'd be very well funded. One person told us that they were on a search for Jessica with law enforcement when this live video was posted, and someone in the group saw it shortly after the video began. They told us that one of the law enforcement officers called Kenny Hallmark to let him know that Alicia Motes was on Facebook, live from the back of his patrol car. We are unsure exactly which arrest this was on Alicia's history, but whatever it was, it was unrelated to Jessica's disappearance. Both Hallmark and his wife are on Alicia's friends list, which isn't surprising given his involvement with Resurrection Ranch and his reputation of getting troubled women in the area into NA classes and similar programs, which is what Stephanie Cochran seemed to be hinting at when she mentioned not being able to get into the same program. Alicia and Hallmark's 
communications appear to be friendly, and it was obvious that they knew each other. But as stated, we knew that to be the case since both had strong connections to Resurrection Ranch. Chief Hallmark also knew Jessica, but there was no record of the two ever communicating in either of Jessica's Facebook accounts. In one of Hallmark's interviews, he told the person he was questioning, I've known Jessica a long time. I've got her into several rehabs, even had her go to church with me. So we've tried. We've tried to help her out. So I've got a little bit at stake here about trying to find the girl, okay? It does appear that Jessica and Jason Williams may have been friends on Facebook. On January 19th, Jason sent Jessica a message that said, Call me ASAP. Of course, this message was sent after Jessica's missing persons report was filed. He did not give a phone number for her to call. There are also messages in Alicia's account to suggest just days before Chief Hallmark arrested her, she knew her arrest was imminent and she was planning to check herself into rehab in an effort to avoid that. On February 12th, four days prior to her arrest, she told several people that she was going back to rehab. That same day, her mother told her that she just needed to turn herself in and get it over with. One person even commented on the Facebook Live video after her arrest. I told you to go back to rehab. Hallmark's name also comes up in reference to Eric Edwards. Not long after Jessica arrived at Gilbert's camper, a woman started sending messages to Eric's Facebook account, warning him, Whatever you are doing, you need to stop and stop now. I think the cops are watching you, Eric. Hallmark got your name in his mouth. This woman went on to caution Eric that she'd been warned by people to stay away from him because of this. Given the time of this conversation and the context indicating some type of relationship between the woman and Eric, it seems likely that Alicia had returned Eric's phone to him since Jessica had made it to Gilbert's and there were no more Facebook communications from Jessica to Eric's account until just before all of her communications came to a halt the next morning. Once Jessica was reported missing, there were a number of law enforcement agencies that became involved. The missing persons report was filed with Haleyville PD. Louise Edwards said that the first law enforcement to show up at their house to ask about Jessica was the Hamilton Police Department and that Kenny Hallmark, Chief of Hackleburg PD, was with them. The Marion County Sheriff's Office also appeared to have early involvement and then at some point, still early into the investigation, the Alabama State Bureau of Investigation became the lead agency on Jessica's case. The FBI was even involved for a very short period of time after Jessica's mother received a ransom demand. We'll talk more about that in a future episode. Even though the missing persons report for Jessica was filed with the Haleyville PD, Hackleberg Chief Kenny Hallmark appears to have been involved in Jessica's case since the beginning. While we are unsure of the reason for his initial involvement, we'd guess that it occurred when it was discovered that Jessica traveled to Gilbert Shaw's camper near the new North Fork Bridge construction site. While the address for those campers and the Edwards home is Hamilton, the area is in an unincorporated part of Marion County and is close to the city of Hackleburg. Hallmark conducted numerous interviews, and we have the transcripts of a few of those. He interviewed a man named Andre Newell, who was married to Alicia, Derek, and Eric Moat's sister. 
the interview was conducted approximately 50 days into Jessica's missing persons case. Andre claimed he was living with his wife, Alicia's sister, in Tennessee at the time that Jessica disappeared. Andre stated they moved there because he got a job in Tennessee. The transcript does not indicate that he was asked where he worked at that time, nor does it indicate he offered the information on his own. It is important to note that Andre Newell knew Jessica Hamby and that the two of them had had some kind of relationship in the past. Chief Hallmark asked him how he heard that Jessica was missing. Andre explained that he was with his wife when Alicia called to tell her about Jessica's disappearance. Hallmark asked why Alicia called to tell them that. Andre said, They went to rehab. That's when they was in rehab together. They was in rehab together and stuff. Chief Hallmark replied and said, "Uh Uh-huh, I know that. Andre went on to tell Hallmark that Alicia called to tell her sister about it because Alicia and Jessica were best friends and Alicia was trying to find Jessica. This is the one and only time we've ever heard anyone refer to Jessica and Alicia as friends, much less best friends. We've spoken to many of Jessica's friends and all have expressed surprise and confusion that Jessica went to see Alicia that night because none of them were aware that Jessica and Alicia were friends. Chief Hallmark asked Andre if he knew a man named Johnny Borden. Andre said, I don't know no Johnny Borden. Hallmark explained that Borden lived right beside him, but Andre still didn't acknowledge that he knew Borden. It became apparent why Hallmark was interviewing Andre when he handed him a screenshot of a message that Borden had sent to someone and asked Andre to read the message aloud. But he must have been speaking low or mumbling because much of what he said is noted in the transcript as inaudible. But you can still get the gist of the message he was reading. It said that Andre admitted he hid Jessica Hamby's body. Miraculously and suddenly, Andre appeared to know exactly who Borden was. The transcript noted that Andre said, Oh no, I didn't even know that she was missing. I was in Tennessee. That's what I'm saying. I was in Tennessee. I didn't know she was missing. He the one that was telling me she was missing. That's what they said. She was, you know. Another law enforcement officer with the last name of Miller spoke up and said, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Who told you? Johnny? But you don't know Johnny. Andre responded, No, I, now that I, I see the picture, I, I know Johnny from when he was over there on Washington Court, and he had said that she was missing. He had told me she was missing. As the interview continued, Andre admitted he did know Borden and that Borden had told him three or four weeks earlier that Jessica was missing. They point out to Andre that he originally claimed he didn't know Borden, and then he told them he found out Jessica was missing because Alicia called his wife. Andre appeared to tweak his story a bit more. He told them when he saw Johnny weeks earlier, Johnny asked him if he knew that Jessica was still missing. Hallmark asked Andre why they were talking about Jessica, and Andre said, No, he shot me the message. He said, that, that that message there is what he sent me. I ain't write him. I ain't talked to him none that night. And he sent me a random message. He sent me a random message. Hallmark 
asked Andre if he pulled up his Facebook account, would he find that message in it as he described? Andre maintained that Borden randomly sent him that message. As the interview transcript concluded, Hallmark was having Andre log into his Facebook account from a computer, and the transcript does not indicate if they located the message Andre claimed Borden randomly sent to him. However, we do have Andre's Facebook records. If Johnny sent that message, or any other message to Andre, there is no record of it. There are some interesting things, though, that are recorded in Andre's Facebook account. As stated in the transcript, Jessica had been missing for approximately 50 days at the time of this interview, so the interview would have occurred around the end of February 2018. Andre stated that he was living in Tennessee at the time of Jessica's disappearance on January 3rd. He told Hallmark he'd only been living in Alabama again for three or four weeks, which would place Andre moving back to Alabama sometime between the end of January to the beginning of February 2018. Andre's Facebook records contained quite a bit of his location history. The location history did not begin until January 8th, but the data recorded by Facebook indicates that Andre was staying in Russellville, Alabama by January 8th, 2018. There's a great number of location data points for him between January 8th and March 3rd, 2018. To be exact, there are 855 individual location points for Andre, and not a single one of them shows him to be in Tennessee. It is also notable that another man came forward to Chief Hallmark to say Andre told him on two different occasions that he got rid of Jessica's body. Alicia Moat's Facebook records also revealed that she received some pretty shocking messages from brother-in-law Andre, her sister's husband. Andre sent Alicia numerous messages on February 12th and 13th, 2018. I'm not going to read these messages because they are graphic and sexual in nature. Andre asked Alicia to send him pics of her body. He described wanting to have sex with her in explicit terms and sent her a very revealing and graphic photo of himself. One of the less explicit messages said, That ass so fat when I grab it. He also sent her a photo of the two of them posing for the camera. They were fully clothed in this photo, but Alicia's sister wasn't in it. There are no messages from Alicia to Andre, but due to Alicia's fondness for deleting her messages, you have to consider that as a possibility. Most notably, the responses that I'd expect to see are also not present. You know, things like, you're married to my sister. Stop sending me inappropriate messages. None of these messages from Andre to Alicia were reflected in Andre's Facebook records, so it appears that Andre deleted messages from his account, too. We've told you about some of the photos taken of things on Alicia's phone that were sent to us. Another item that was allegedly discovered on her phone that we haven't discussed is a disturbing photo that shows a woman sitting on the floor of what appears to be a motel room. The image appears to be a photo taken of a photo displayed on Alicia's phone. We suspect the original source of the image was likely a screenshot taken of a video. 
I say all that to explain that the quality of the image is not great. The woman on the floor is small-framed like Jessica. The image was taken from behind and a little to the left of her. You don't need to see her face to know that she's in distress. Her left leg is bent at the knee, and it is bent back so that her foot is behind her on her right side. Her right leg is crossed over the left leg. Her knee is somewhat bent, and it is in front of the woman, but on her left side. The woman is hunched over, and she has both arms up over her head to shield it. Another woman is standing over her. This woman is also slightly bent over. She is holding on to the victim with one hand, and you can see her other hand and arm are raised up as if she's hitting the woman that's on the floor. The woman's left ankle is visible, and it appears to have a dark line around it. One wrist is also visible, and it too has the appearance of something around it. Many people, including some veteran law enforcement officers, have stated that it appears to them that the mark on her ankle is from being bound, and they believe that's also what can be seen on her wrist, either a binding still in place or the mark left behind once the binding was removed. It's difficult to make out what's around the edges of the image, but it does appear that there could be multiple other people standing in a circle around the woman on the floor. Jessica's family had been given this photo a year or two ago, and they did provide it to law enforcement, but never heard anything else about it. Most, if not all, of Jessica's family and friends that had seen the photo were struck by the resemblance of the woman on the floor to Jessica. But due to the poor image quality and the angle the image was taken from, it seemed impossible to determine if it was Jessica or not. The woman standing above her did resemble Alicia Motes, But with the low quality of the image, we weren't confident enough to say that it was her. Initially, we showed the image to numerous people privately, but none of them were able to positively identify either woman. So we posted it to the podcast Facebook page and requested the assistance of anyone who could help us identify either of the women and the location the photo was taken. Within an hour of the post, Alicia Motes commented on the post admitting that she was the woman standing in the photo and that she was hitting the woman on the floor. She wanted us to remove the image. She did provide the name of the woman in the photo, the location where it occurred, and the date it happened. She told us the incident took place at a motel in Russellville. I asked if the woman was bound or if she had been bound. Alicia said the woman was never bound. She stated that the line on the ankle was an anklet and the line on the wrist was a bracelet. We did remove the image from Facebook, but not because Alicia asked us to. We obtained the information needed And from that information, we do believe we've been able to independently determine that the woman in the photo is not Jessica Hamby. Alicia seems to be of the opinion that what occurred in that photo was no big deal. She commented that she was sure everyone had been in a fight before. Let me be clear, though. What was depicted in this photo was not a fight. What the photo displays is a woman cowering on the ground, guarding her head, while Alicia appeared to still be striking her, and others were very possibly standing around her in a circle, 
and one person was videoing or photographing the event to share on social media. Oh yeah, that's right. The photo taken indicates that this post was made on a social media platform. At this point, it seems pretty clear that what led Jessica to be in the North Fork area after leaving the Journey Detox on the evening of January 2nd, 2018, was much more than drug addiction. It is also clear that Jeremy Abbott's death is tied to Jessica's disappearance in many ways, beyond her simply having knowledge or information about what happened to him. There are strong ties between the persons of interest in both Jessica and Jeremy's cases. Jessica was scared and trying to avoid certain people and places for much of 2017, but she didn't seem to be able to get completely away. As Mary told us, these circles are small and the same people circulate within them. In the next episode, we will look at some of the other people in these overlapping circles and discuss more of the relationships, allegations, and possible involvement of these individuals. Join us next time as we further explore what happened to both Jessica Hamby and Jeremy Abbott and as we continue to investigate and push for justice for them both. If you have any information that could help to solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205 282 07 Four zero. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are still left wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have filled it with great information on Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will be adding additional content about Jessica and Jeremy. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All of the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with the additional expense to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you too are helping us help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica and Jeremy. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com.